It's a beautiful thing to be in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So we want to thank our worship team, our musicians. Thank you so much. God is so good to us. We pray so you may be seated in the presence of our God. I'm going to jump right in. I don't expect to be here long before you, but I do believe we have a word from the Lord. Amen. 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 So for our 15th anniversary, I asked you all to honor the God who gave the vision for this house, Hope Cathedral, by using your days, your months, your years, even your generations to embrace the mission that he has given to us as his sons and his daughters, as the body of Christ. And that is the mission to people. And so tonight, we're going to use that message as a launching pad to understand in greater detail how. How will we make a difference? With all of my insecurities, all of my weaknesses, all of my flaws, my failings, all of my fears, how will I, how will we impact the world? I believe the scriptures give us an answer, but we're going to focus on 12 men, 12 men who began with a curious following for Christ, but then they somehow became committed in their conversion. People who are marginalized, who soon became a global phenomenon. People who lived with intimidation, but somehow became a bold witness. How, how did they make the transition? My prayer is that from their transformation, we ourselves will rise in faith. That we ourselves will, will, will increase in our expectation and that our influence will actually in, expand. And so we're going to look at the scriptures found in Acts. Acts chapter 1. We're going to read from verse 1 to verse 8. And I just want to encourage you that normally when you start reading, you're not really there. But I want you to pay careful attention to what's said there in Acts chapter 1. Because it's there that we can find out how. Amen? Amen. Acts chapter 1, we're reading from 1 to 8. It's on the screen. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of of the earth. It is said that Luke, the person who wrote the Gospel of Luke, is also the writer for the book of Acts. And it's there in the Gospel of Luke that this writer Luke is trekking Jesus' journey, his journey into Jerusalem where he would be tried and where he would be crucified. He writes this book called Acts as his second letter or his second writing. There in Acts, he begins in Jerusalem where he begins to tell us all that Jesus began to do and began to teach from Jerusalem into the world. But it's not Jesus himself, it's actually these disciples. What is it? 
that made the shift for these disciples. In other words, after Jesus was crucified and before he went to sit at the right hand of God the Father, he's talking to these disciples for 40 days. He tells them of infallible proofs. He shows himself. He proves himself. But he talks to them about two things. One, he talks about the kingdom of God. And then he talks about the Holy Spirit. It's interesting because anytime I'm leaving someone and I want them to know what I really want them to do or what I really think is important, that's the last thing that I'll say. Don't forget, by the way, remember too. And so Jesus is leaving and these are the two things that he hones in on for the disciples. And so we've, been, we've had maybe a month, a month and a half where PT has been talking to us about the kingdom of God. Excellent job, amen? Amen. We should be growing and we should know quite a bit about the kingdom of God. But tonight what I want to do is I want to talk just a little bit of one aspect of the kingdom of God, and that is obedience. How will we make a difference? We will make a difference in the lives of others through our obedience to God. And so I want to begin by focusing on this part called the body of Christ. Come on, say the body. The body body of Christ. Now, most times when you hear about the body of Christ, you hear about how we have different roles and different functions. This says in Romans chapter 12, as well as 1 Corinthians chapter 12, how we each have a position. We each have a role. In other words, the person who's standing here singing or teaching has no more greater value than the person in the sound booth, has no more greater value than the person who works with the small group ministry, has no more greater value than the person who's greeting. That all have the same value. And this is what the scripture is talking about. That we're all members working together in the body. We're one. No one is better than the other. We're all working as one for the sake of the gospel. But tonight, what I want to do is I want us to consider the church. I want us to consider the church beyond the gifts and the talents, the roles and the functions, beyond that from the local and broad perspective, and I want us to see the church as the physical embodiment of Jesus himself. And so we're going to look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1 chapter chapter 1 verse 18, and it reads, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, it says, And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his what? Body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 23, the focus looks like it's on the husband and wife, but there is a reference here. There in verse 23 it says, for the husband is head of the wife as also Christ is head of the church and he is the savior of the body. So what is my point? Christ is the what? Head. The church is the? You are the? body because you are the church. Now in the natural, when you think about the head and you think about a body, they must be attached for there to be any kind of movement. A head is what signals to the body how it should respond. If your leg starts itching, it's not the skin that tells you to scratch. All signals come from the head. Signal comes to your head, there's something agitating your skin on your leg. And so your fingers get in place and then they start responding to the signal that came from your head, not from your leg. In the same way, when you think about the body of Christ, signals come from the head and the response should be to the body. 
When I think about the head and I think about a body and I think about how it's, it's impossible for a body to respond without a head. And then I think about the body of Christ and how the church, the body, is trying to respond without the head. Then we wonder why we're not seeing results because if there's no signal coming down, then there can be no response. But if the church would stay connected to the head, then you can get the signals and you can respond accordingly. And so if you're disconnected, you get no signals. You have no idea what to do. I remember when I was a little girl, I came home from school and my granddaddy said, we're going to have fresh chicken tonight. I said, fresh chicken? He said, yes, we're going to have fresh chicken tonight. I said, oh, okay. Had no idea what he had in mind until I saw a chicken. And I said, granddaddy, there's a chicken in the backyard. He said, yes, we're going to have fresh chicken tonight. And so I said, I want to see. And so we went to the backyard and he took this chicken head and he laid it on the brick. And then he took a hatchet and he chopped off the head. The head went on the patio and this body, this body started running all over the backyard without the head. The body started running haphazardly. It ran aimlessly. It bumped into something and it kept on running until finally it fell over. And we had fresh chicken <laughs> that night. What is my point? There are people within the body of Christ. They have no head. So they're running around aimlessly. They're running around without leadership, running around without any focus, without any direction. They're running around trying to figure out how am I going to make it? How are things going to change? They're running around with no head until they fall to the side and say, I can't do it anymore in my own strength because you must be connected to the head. When you're connected to the head, you can hear the signals that tell you what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and how fast you should go. And so it's easy for me then to say that you're called as an ambassador. Why? Because he's the one who says that he'll tell you what to say and he'll give you what to speak. You're not detached, but you are connected to the head. And that's what Jesus said. I only say what my father tells me to say. And I only speak what he tells me to speak. I can call you a mouthpiece because you're connected to the head. He said, I put my word in your mouth and I cover you with the shadow of my hand. I can call you a, a minister of reconciliation. Why? Because he said, I will make my appeal through you. That it's not you, you're just connected to the head. Now, when the head gives a signal for you to scratch, you don't start running. When the head gives a signal to scratch, you simply scratch. So powerful are the signals that you can be laying in your bed asleep and your head will signal danger from a, a dream. And your body will start responding. Amen. Your heart will start pounding. You might even wake up in a sweat. You have not left your bed, but your signals have said danger, danger. And so it should be in the body of Christ that we don't have to think, we just respond. That whatever the signal says, that's what we do. Wherever he says go, that's where, he say, that's where we go. Whatever he says do, that's what we do because we're connected to the head. And then through you, he will make his appeal to the lost. Through you, he will lay hands on the sick. Through you, the hurting will be healed. Through you. How will you make a difference? By staying connected to the head. Amen. The scripture bears witness to this because Jesus tells us in John 15, he says, abide in me and, and I in you as the branch cannot, cannot, cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 6, without me, you can do nothing. 
that if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. When you're feeling like you're overwhelmed, when you're feeling burnt out, when you're feeling like you can't make it, you have to check, am I connected to the head or am I like the chicken? I'm running and I'm doing, but I'm really not connected to the head. I'm doing a good thing, but I'm not doing a God thing right in this moment. Am I connected to the head? And this is what obedience is all about. It's staying connected. It's simply following the signals from the head. It's the way of the kingdom of God. Obedience. The next thing Jesus tells them as they're gathered together, he says, I want you to wait for the baptism. I want you to wait for the baptism, and this is because you're going to need some power. You can't do it in your own strength in the same way that I received the Spirit and then I was able to go out. You're going to need to get the Spirit, and then I'm going to give you power because I need you to be my witnesses. This is the second thing that he's talking about. Now, what's interesting about this is that the disciples, they don't hone in on the power. They don't hone in on the witnesses. They don't own witness thing. They don't hone in on baptism. Excuse me. They're not even focused on the way of God at all. How do I know? Because these disciples are focused on the world. This is what they say. They say, uh, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Everything that Jesus is doing, he's talking about power, baptism, witnessing, and they say, uh, excuse me, are, are you going to now show yourself as the king? Here's, here's what I mean. See, when Israel sinned against God, all throughout the Bible, every time they sinned against God, they found themselves in bondage to another nation because of their sin. Every time. They turned their back on God, did what was right in their own eyes. They were disobedient, and they found themselves in bondage, whether the bondage was to Egypt, whether it was to the Philistines, whether it was to the Midianites, whether it was to Babylon. Each time the people found themselves in bondage, they would turn around to God, cry out, and each time God would send a deliverer. We know Moses. He came to bring them out. He used a deliverer. It was Samson or Gideon. You can read your Bible and see how each time he sent a deliverer for Israel's deliverance. No different now. 400 years have passed and Israel is under the domain of Rome. They are waiting for their deliverer. God, when are you going to save us? We're in bondage. We're oppressed in the same way that we were oppressed in Egypt. When are you coming to help us? So then Jesus comes on the scene. <gasps> Our Savior has come. He's healing the sick. He's raising the dead. You are the Savior. So they are expecting that this Savior is going to come and set up a natural throne. This Savior will be their king. He's going to crush Roman rule, and then he's going to reign, and all of Israel will be empowered once again. They have in mind the way of the world. We will rule, and they will listen to us now. But Jesus doesn't follow the way of the world. He walks according to the kingdom. He's connected to the head. So when Jesus comes, he comes and he dies on a cross. He not only dies on the cross, but he rises again. And he comes to crush something, and they're thinking it means it's time for you to crush Rome, another nation. But Jesus is saying, no, I didn't come to crush another nation. I came to crush sin. The very thing that keeps you in bondage to another nation and another nation and another nation. I came to take sin off of your back so you're no longer under the dominion of sin and death. But you've been set free, redeemed. You are free from the dominion of sin. And they didn't understand it. So will you at this time set up your kingdom? Will you now reign? And Jesus looks at them and says, you still, you still don't get it. And so many of us are in that same place. 
We don't understand that we've been delivered from the power of darkness. We've been set free from sin. You're no longer under the dominion of, free, of sin. You are free. And he whom the Son sets free is free. We know the scripture, but somehow we're not staying connected to the head to walk it out. That you are redeemed, the redeemed of the Lord. That's why we can say the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever because you're no longer tethered to sin so that every time it calls, you have to respond. You've been set free. The disciples were focused on the way of the world instead of the way of the kingdom. They followed the signal and went to Jerusalem and waited in the end. But it didn't start that way. So they started off not understanding. But it was okay because grace was sufficient. So when it was all said and done, they went in Jerusalem and they waited. They waited for the baptism. Those same men with insecurities, with issues, they were now witnesses all around them. What happened? What made the difference? The, the power of the Holy Spirit. That they were no longer looking at their life from a lens of sin and death, but now they can look through the lens of Jesus Christ and say, I am set free, which means I am now going to stay connected that whatever he tells me to do, that's what I will do. Amen. And these same men became witnesses. They're really no different from each and every one of us. I thought about Peter, and I thought we could just kind of highlight him. Peter was a man who started following Jesus. He follows him, but he's not really convinced. How do we know? Because when Jesus tells him, he's a fisherman by trade, Jesus tells him, I want you to go and launch out in the deep and put down your net. Peter says, well... You know what, Jesus, I'm just going to pacify you because I already know we're not going to catch any fish. I've been out all night, and you can't kiss, catch fish in the middle of the day. You got to go uh, at night. And now you're saying go, the fish are going to see the net. He had a whole bunch of stuff going on. But he said, nevertheless, I know, you know, I'm going to go ahead out here and put my nets out. He puts his nets out, and then the Bible says that so many fish came into the net that the net began to break. When he comes back to shore, that's when he says, my Lord and my God, there's a change. <laughs> then we see how it's Peter who, who sees Jesus walking on the water. He's, he's amused. Look at, he's walking, bid me come, Jesus. And he gets out of the boat because Jesus says, you can come out. As soon as he sees the winds and the waves, he looks at the facts, right? The facts and the circumstances, the Bible says he begins to sing. Help me, Jesus, right? Can you see yourself in these scenarios? Help me, Lord. I'm looking at the facts and, oh, help me, Lord. And Jesus saves him right in that moment. G Peter was a hothead. The John's account is that when they came to get Jesus, that it was Peter who pulled out his sword and cut off the high priest's ear. Other accounts don't say it was Peter, but John says it was Peter. <laughs> I don't know who you think you are. <laughs> cut off his ear. And Jesus said, are we leading a rebellion to put the man's ear back on him? <laughs> it was Peter. Peter, who's, who looked at Jesus and said, I will never deny you. I got your back. I'll never leave you, Jesus. I'm here for you all the way. <laughs> Jesus looked at him and said, before the cock crows, you'll deny me. And sure enough, who was that? I don't know. Who, I don't even know the man. The Bible says he even cussed. I don't even know who you're talking about. So this Peter, wishy-washy Peter, this Peter who wasn't connected all the time, this Peter, who had all kinds of issues, just like us, is the same Peter in Acts chapter 1 who rises up and says, this Lord and this Christ. Yeah. It's the same Peter in chapter 2 that says, Jesus is the Savior. Yeah. It's the same Peter in chapter 3 that says, Jesus is the one who you crucified. Chapter 4, on and on, this is the same Peter who was always having problems, who now stands up and says, Jesus is the savior of the world. What happened? He stayed connected and he had the power. And the same is possible for each and every one of us. That no matter who we are, no matter what our issues are, no matter where we've come from, no matter what is going on in our life today, 
We can make a difference in the lives of people all around us when we choose to stay connected and we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 I'm going to invite you to bow your head and close your eyes. Tonight, I want to encourage you that Jesus is not just Savior. He's not just a Savior, as Pastor already said, but he's our Savior. He's your Savior. He's there for you right now. That no matter what you're facing, no matter how difficult or challenging, no matter what the issue, you serve a Savior. He is your Redeemer, and he knows how to bring us out. He knows how to deliver us completely. And so if you're here tonight and you're burdened, you're oppressed, you're weighted by the cares of life, you're worried, you're concerned, you're saddened because of news, you're under pressure, you're thinking about the past, thinking about today, thinking about tomorrow, I want to remind you that you have a Savior. His name is Jesus. And he said that when you call upon him, he will answer. And so I want to give you a few minutes to call upon Jesus, to call upon him even now and trust him to bring salvation to your situation. I'm giving you the time to talk to your father. your care upon him. He cares for you. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. And with every temptation, he provides an escape. Father, we thank you that you open our eyes of understanding that no matter where we are, we can see you right in the midst. That as your sons and your daughters call upon you, that you answer them. I thank you, Lord, that you reveal yourself and that you speak to their hearts even now. You said your secret counsel is with the upright. So I trust you, Lord, that you are speaking, that you are giving wisdom, that you are giving knowledge and understanding. I trust you, Lord, that you're showing the strategy, that you're giving an escape. I trust you, Father, that you are shepherding the lives of your people even now. If you're here and you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart, but you'd like to do so tonight, we'll pray with you and for you. It's just a matter of inviting him into your heart. If you're here and you'd like us to pray with you and for you, just raise your hand and we'll pray with you and for you. I see that hand. I see the hand. But even more than that, our Father sees that hand. And so I'm going to invite all of us to pray together because hope doesn't let anyone pray alone. Amen. So let's pray. Father in heaven, I believe that you have given your son, Jesus Christ, that I may be saved. So I welcome him into my heart. I repent for my sins. I trust you to wash me and cleanse me. And I put my hope in you, Father. I declare Jesus is Lord to your glory and to your honor. In Jesus' name. If you're here tonight, and you are someone who you're disconnected. Yeah, you've asked Jesus to be your savior, but the reality is you're not really connected to the head. You're still doing what you want to do, when you want to do it, and how you want to do it. And there are times when you hear the spirit of the Lord telling you, and you're still resisting. I don't want to do that. I'm afraid to do that. What happens if I do that? You've got a bunch of excuses of why you're not following directions. 
Well, I want to give you a chance to repent because I think there are more than less of us in the here with that. And I want to give you a chance to repent because God wants to use you. He wants to use you on your workplace. He wants to use you in your family. He wants to use you to, with people that you don't even know, but they're set right beside you. And God is giving you an opportunity to let the Spirit of God work through you for His glory and His glory alone. And you're busy thinking that you're okay because you go to church. I'm okay because I got the songs down. I'm okay because I know how to lift my hands, but yet you're disconnected. I want to give you a chance to repent. I want to give you a chance to get it right with the Lord because I believe God wants to do more than less through your life. That there is a purpose and a plan in your life and disobedience will limit you, hinder you, and stall the purpose that God has just for you. So take a few moments and just repent as we continue to hear the music.